Hello all, I'm Michael Watson, Director, Head of Distribution, and thank you for joining our economic update. Having already endured one and a half years of COVID-affected conditions, we began FY22 with most of Australia's population entering another extended period of lockdown. Melbourne became the longest lockdown city on earth, while Sydney entered their own period of extended lockdown, which lasted through until mid-October. Despite most of the country eagerly awaiting borders to reopen and keen to get the year that was behind us, there was still volatility in the road ahead. Certainly, 2022 has not been easy for investors. Facing into the early part of the pandemic, economists were predicting substantial and extended economic pain for our national economy. In fact, it was not uncommon to see well-regarded commentators talking about the prospects of a depression. Yet, the cumulative weight of record household savings, accommodative fiscal and monetary settings, and low unemployment provided the ballast to drive resilience. Indeed, the property market continued to grow, GDP rebounded, and conditions for 2022 looked bright. Of course, the event most punctuating markets in FY22 would be the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. With expectations of conflict starting to build from November 2021, the invasion ultimately began from late February. Inflation, which had already been showing signs of returning to trend, suddenly accelerated on the back of surging costs of energy and oil. And another round of market volatility began. The domestic economy again showed itself to be surprisingly resilient. Households continued to spend, invest and save as the unemployment rate continued to fall. Though forecasts of strong GDP were adjusted to moderate, the Australian economy continued to grow. In May 2022, our Reserve Bank eventually reacted to rising inflationary pressures by increasing the official cash rate for the first time in a decade, with further increases in June right through to October. Residential house prices softened from their peak However, forecasts of the retracement stayed relatively consistent across market commentators, even as interest rates rose. Against all of the headwinds, the engine room of our economy looks to be well sheltered and resilient for the immediate future. On that note, let's look at some of the headwinds and tailwinds which will help or hinder the progress in the year ahead. Firstly, the headwinds and the drivers of inflation over the past year were many, as the global economy woke up faster than supply could accommodate, fueled by a combination of QE, record fiscal stimulus from domestic and foreign governments, fuel and shipping constraints of a rebounding economy, all of which started to get inflation moving around 12 months ago. The Russian invasion of Ukraine and subsequent shocks saw inflation jump to double digit prints in some countries. In decades past, inflation has derailed economies. However, the supply-driven nature of this cycle has made it harder to combat with the simple tool of central bank rates, although that is and has been the weapon of choice, really is one of the very few, few tools left in central banks' arsenals, having deployed most other options to fight off the pandemic impacts in the first instance. So inflation is high and likely to remain elevated in the year ahead. Pleasingly though, as indicators show, domestic inflation to be peaking, but it is still likely to remain structurally higher than the preceding decade. Inflation remains a genuine headwind, particularly when also considering the standard of living impacts that high inflation has on the common household. In short, the inflation genie needs to be put back in the bottle, something the Reserve Bank is committed to achieving in the medium term. Whether it's the impact on international currency prices, calculating a future value of a company's cash flows, or a borrower making repayments on their loan, interest rates matter. You may recall us highlighting in our previous quarterly updates how the US Fed historically moves hard and decisively up or down when it sees fit. And this has certainly been the case in response to the current inflationary environment, as the Fed has moved to whack inflation, which has been a bigger influence on the US economy than here in Australia. Central banks all over have been hiking rates at a pace not seen in decades. And while they might be nearing their terminal rates, and we might be just one further, weight, one further turn away from that domestically, the movement from a zero rate 
so swiftly upwards will continue to have an impact long into 2023 and beyond. Central banks are trying to achieve a soft landing, cooling inflation while not cooking their respective economies. And as landings go, in terms of degree of difficulty, this is like Sully landing on the Hudson. It can't be just monetary policy doing the heavy lifting though, and governments are being asked to live up to their side of the bargain. And if you don't believe me, ask Liz Truss, who in the UK tried to introduce unfunded expansionary policy, large S, in a recent mini budget. This saw their currency smashed and a series of embarrassing policy backflips ensued. Our own federal government with its upcoming mini budget this month will undoubtedly have watched with great rates of interest. On a plus side, for the first time in a very long time, interest rates are benefiting for the investor. If only there were products that could take advantage of that without all the volatility. Curbing inflation has flow on effects. Right now, we have an interesting set of statistics for contemplation. A tangible means of calculating business confidence is a survey of likely future capital expenditure by business. Consider then that these have dived as interest rates have increased. Capital expenditure is typically made in anticipation of growth and expansion. Seeing it falling is a harbinger of hard-baked lower growth and lower productivity. The forward-looking GDP growth deviation from its potential is also universally lower, meaning that it's likely that GDP will come in lower than previously anticipated across the US, Canada, UK and Australia. Australia has fared remarkably well, but it's not immune from the swings of global markets. The current and forecast activity indicators described by Goldman Sachs shows lacklustre economic activity into the end of 2022 and through 2023, a benign outcome that will do little to fire economic engines struggling against inflation and increasing interest rates. Ultimately, while some economies will struggle for growth and some will undoubtedly fall into recession for a period, it is unlikely that a global recession will ensue. It's likely that an initial period of low growth will exist while countries in the population navigate this period and reset into a higher rate environment. Now, working smarter, not harder is something we have all heard at one stage or another when we're trying to get more out of each day. At a macro level, for any country to maintain higher wages and higher standards of living, it must do just this by increasing its productivity. Australia has often been described as the lucky country, and we had a 30-year run of uninterrupted economic growth between the last two recessions. We were the envy of most of the world as the little economy that could. However, looking at the productivity growth through this period, and it's hard to mount an argument that we worked, that we worked smarter. Particularly post-GFC, business investment levels fell away almost completely, with the net effect of this underinvestment being baked in inefficiencies. Consider the economic output per employee per hours worked between, between Australia and the USA. Accounting for inflation, exchange rates, etc. Back in the 1950s, the average US worker produced $4 of additional output for every hour than their Australian counterpart in today's terms. Fast forward to the most recent stats and the average US worker now produces over $12 of additional economic output per hour above their Aussie counterpart. We use the US data for comparison as they are the world leaders in productivity. However, as a smaller, high cost economy, Australia needs to focus really hard on this thematic. Possibly ultra low unemployment will assist in turning this around, but it's really hard issue to navigate both practically and politically. Productivity or lack thereof certainly won't go away and the consequences for Australia will ultimately be lower growth and lower standard of living. Moving now to economic tailwinds, and one of the shining lights of all the economic outcomes across the pandemic was that Australians overwhelmingly kept their jobs. There was an initial pandemic-induced spike in numbers which saw unemployment peak at 7.4% back in June 2020, which was still well short of the double-digit forecasts which were common at the time and at the outset of the pandemic. Unemployment has steadily decreased since, 
And let's just reflect on the amazing position we find ourselves in. Unemployment is at 50 year lows and widely tipped to stay low into 2023. Underemployment is at historic lows. Participation rate is at decadal highs. In short, to the extent we'll ever be able to say this, everybody who wants a job has a job. For Australians, that means we are also at work like never before. And through 2022, in aggregate, undertook more hours worked than ever before in our history. Quite an amazing feat on the back of a one in 100 year pandemic. One of the facets which will provide genuine stability to the economy is the growth in full-time employment. Where previously part-time or contract-only work saw a population with income uncertainty, the jobs being filled currently are full-time. Full-time employment underpins the stability of individuals and families' income and it represents a great tailwind for the economy. Finally, to wages growth, and it is picking itself up off the floor, having fallen alongside inflation over the last couple of decades. While currently outpaced by inflation, the recent direction is really positive, and with unemployment so low, it will continue to claw back against the worst impacts of inflation. Now, I'll touch on household balance sheets, XX savings, and mortgage ahead shortly, but these are also big winners from sustained low unemployment. When factories and production shut down in the first months of the pandemic, few realised it would switch back on as fast as it did. The result, the world just couldn't get enough raw materials. With Australia so well placed to deliver across a range of raw materials, this gives tremendous ballast to our economy. Consider the RBA's index of commodity prices. This is looking to have peaked recently, but still well above the longer run levels seen through previous minerals booms. Government revenues are boosted through commodities, which is massively important as we look to pay back the fiscal policy response to the pandemic. The chart on screen from the federal government budget papers back in May shows that post-pandemic, each subsequent financial year saw an improved forecast of government revenues. Initially supposed to be hard-baked, structurally lower well into the future, it continues to improve. Until now, we have had population growth firmly as a headwind, with closed borders during the pandemic leading to a structurally lower population base, which have had a real ongoing impact on economic output. <clears throat> While there's been no material policy shift regarding the numbers of migrant intakes into Australia, the gates are finally open and the planes are landing again. This will help to deliver a range of positive outcomes across the economic landscape. Consider residential property. The boom we saw post-pandemic was in the complete absence of population growth. Perhaps the increasing numbers of new arrivals will help put an effective floor on prices, which are continuing to come off. Much of the resilience of the Australian economy over many years has been its status as a destination for high quality, skilled immigrants. As one of the most multicultural diverse nations on earth, the Australian multicultural story has driven a better and more balanced economy and indeed community. There are two parts to this. Beginning with the sudden impact of losses in our key sectors of education, tourism and hospitality, each are big employers nationally. Short-term visitors spend big dollars while holidaying, which is critical for our capital cities, but also for tourist destinations. Though borders are open, we're still some way off the pre-pandemic levels. Those coming across for a multi-year tertiary education not only support the education industry itself, but also those adjacent industries, property, hospitalities, and a whole range of other services. Critically, these often serve also as forays for young, skilled people to look for longer-term residency in Australia, building on our global networks for the next generations of human capital. Of course, as borders closed, we saw an immediate fall in migration, which is set to have a lasting impact on our population growth. It's long been said that demographics are destiny. Any country with an aging population will suffer with increased taxes and decreased output. And while some of this can be offset by, say, people working longer, the can can only be kicked down the road so far. Noting our own stable, at best, natural increase in population, 
Australia will again rely on return to pre-pandemic migration levels to support the economy going forward. It cannot be understated just how well we performed through COVID, both in isolation, literally, but also compared with our international counterparts. Full employment and a locked down population in an environment of low interest rates saw immense volumes of excess savings in households. Household balance sheets are around their strongest ever positions with circa $250 billion in surplus savings. Globally, Australia saw the second highest change in wealth per adult than any country in the world. And remember, we were not in isolation with our property growth. In fact, we were back in the pack. We genuinely outperformed through this period. Looking forward, leading indicators of economic activity see us positioned higher than the US and Europe. As I conclude our headwinds and tailwinds report, this is testament to the resilience of our economy and shows that on balance, our economic tailwinds are greater than our economic headwinds.